Hello, everybody. I'm Secular Spirit, and this is uh, take two of the start of the live stream. Um, we actually, me and Sydney, who was my guest for this live stream, we actually started talking, and then I realized I didn't press the start the broadcast button. So uh, welcome, Sydney. Um, Thank you. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I actually appeared on Sydney's uh, podcast recently to just share my story of uh, growing up Muslim and uh, why I left Islam and all that fun stuff. And while we were talking, you shared a little bit about your own story. And what I thought was so interesting was even though we grew up in completely different countries and were raised in very different religions, what, what I found out was our religions are also very similar in a lot of key mm -hmm. ways. And I thought it'd be super interesting to just hear your own story in more detail. So well, welcome to the channel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm super stoked to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a little bit. Um, so for anyone who might be newer to the idea of like Christianity or fundamentalism or evangelicalism, um, I'm from the southern United States. I'm from the state of Arkansas. And so we have uh, what I call, I grew up fundy adjacent. So like I didn't necessarily grow up fundamentalist, but in my church, there were fundamentalist families. Um, for example, anybody who watches reality TV might be familiar with the Duggars. They're, they're known for like 19 kids accounting, 20 kids and counting. They went to my church for a while before a lot of the stuff they do now, like um, in their the church they're a part of now, which is basically a cult, was not the church that I went to. But before then, when there were fewer kids in that family, we went to the same church. I had the same piano teacher as them. So I was aware of fundamentalist and evangelical people growing up. Um, but I didn't realize until I was an adult that even when you grow up religious in a more like casual way, even when you grow up religious in a more socially normal way, you can still have the exact same religious trauma and you can still be impacted negatively or just in specific ways from religion, even when you know people who are way more religious or way more strict than you. And I thought a lot of what you talked about in your story was so similar to my story. And like you said, even though two different religions, two different countries, um, it's very interesting how being a part of a religion can be so similar across the world and deconstructing from religion can be so similar across the world. No, for sure. And I mean, as I discussed uh, when I was talking with you, and I've shared this on my channel in the past, I didn't even grow up in a particularly religious family. Uh, my yeah. parents weren't re really religious at all, actually. Mm. And yet I was very religious and I got a lot of that religious trauma, yes. despite my parents <laughs> trying to not allow that to happen, which is yeah. which is so fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I would love to just ask you a few more details about... Yeah your your Christian upbringing. I just wanted to say special thank you to Secular Rarity who connected us. Uh, thank you so mm -hmm. much, Secular Rarity, for that. I don't know if uh, Secular Rarity has a YouTube channel, but he's pretty active on Twitter, so you can mm -hmm. find him there. So yeah, hello yeah. if you're watching Secular Rarity. Yeah, I joke with him all the time that he's the only person I know who's on hundreds of YouTube videos and none of them are on his channel. His channel's totally empty. They're all other people's oh, is channels. It? Okay. But he's on YouTube every single day participating in something. It's just never on his own channel. Um yeah, so I grew up in Arkansas and we went to a Baptist church. Um, I made a joke to you earlier where even though we called ourselves non-denominational in America, that just means Baptist. <laughs> no matter how much people try to say yeah. that they're non-denominational, it's pretty much always what that means. And we have a lot of the core beliefs of Christianity, you know, where you are expected to save yourself for marriage. You're expected to, you know, women are expected to behave in one way and men are expected to behave in another way. And even though, I, so I grew up with a single mom, my dad actually, he died a week after my first birthday. And even though she was very much like, she was very pro me learning to do everything on my own, you know, just in case anything ever happens, you need to learn to survive and on your own and take care of things like chores and cooking and bills. And she taught me a lot. And she was very, uh, I guess you would say like feminist, but at the same time, also very Christian. So a lot of the rules in our household were Christian rules. And so you know, things like most evangelicals or fundamentalist people are anti-gay, anti-trans, things like that. My mom is 
not that way at all. She's very liberal for a Southern Baptist lady, but there are still things like you need to pray about problems. And if your problems aren't being solved, then maybe you need to pray harder or maybe you need to pray differently, or maybe God has a different plan for you. You can't dress in certain ways because that's, you know, that's not very Christian of you to dress that way. Um, and it's, it's just interesting to kind of reflect back on how much of your life, even when you're done with religion is impacted by religion. Like, um, I remember when I was in college and the first time I ever made out with a guy and I remember feeling so guilty and disgusted, even though we just made out like full on clothes, everything. Um, I just remember thinking like, oh, I'm so disgusting. I'm so gross. Like that's unacceptable. You can't act that way. And upon reflection, it was because of religion. It was because of, you know, what would God think? What would my church members think? What would my community think? And a lot of the tenets of Christianity involve making sure that your community look at you a certain way and making sure that your church members look at you a certain way. And it's all about you are blamed for anything that goes wrong. God is thanked for anything that goes right. And your entire existence is making sure that the outside meets what the rules are. Like you dress appropriately, you act appropriately, you're nice to everybody, you don't ruffle any feathers. That's a lot of what is expected of you. And again, in I, I'm not sure what your experience might have been growing up, but in Christianity, it's all very self-blame. It's very, it's your job to establish your relationship with God. It's your job to uphold that relationship. It's your job to ask forgiveness. If something isn't going right, it's your job to pray or find out why that isn't going right. And so there's a lot of self-blame that you don't realize you carry with you throughout the rest of your life. You know, I've been an atheist for years now, and I still find myself making me 100% responsible for every single thing, even when it's unrealistic, even when it's something that I could not have controlled. My brain still goes to that area where it's like, what did I do to deserve this? What, did, what could I have done differently to change the outcome of this? So we used to go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays and Sundays were the big, you know, sermons and things like that with the preacher from the pulpit. And then Wednesdays were more about hanging with other kids, playing basketball at church, you know, trying to make church like a fun place to be. But in those same exact environments, that's where you learn so much of this kind of ingrained culture so much of this well if a, a boy is mean to you he likes you but also you need to make sure that you didn't make him be mean to you because of what you were wearing or something like that um and something also about christianity is it's it's very much a contest in a lot of churches who's there the earliest who's there the most often whose kids look the the most groomed and well behaved whose husband is one of the deacons and so it's very performative in a way that sticks with you even after you've left the church, even when you say, you know, I don't necessarily believe in, in God or heaven or, you know, things like that. You still find yourself impacted in areas of your life that you never even thought of as connected to religion in any way. And so I was devoutly Christian until I was probably... 24 or 25 and I'm turning 32 this year so it wasn't that long ago but I remember one of the things they teach you in Christianity is when you enter the real world like the secular world whether it's in college or as in adulthood um the devil will try to get you to lose faith in God. You'll be introduced to, you know, to bad music, bad people, party culture, drugs, alcohol, and and they they emphasize it will it will look fun because the devil wants it to look fun. You will think, "Oh, I want to be a part of that. I want to do drugs and drink and party because it will look like it's a good time, but that's all the devil." And so when you start to question things, when you start to be like this doesn't really make sense. A lot of these rules contradict one another. A lot of these verses contradict one another. Why is the in the New Testament something one way, but then in like the Old Testament, it's a different way. When you start to question those things, you start thinking, oh no, 
this is what they warned me about my whole life. This is the devil creeping in, making me question things. I'm losing my faith because so much of it is blind faith. So much of it is you shouldn't question. You should just believe. You shouldn't need proof. You should just believe. Um, the, the beauty in the world around you should be enough proof that God exists and that he created this world. Don't ask questions that might make you question your belief in God because that's the devil. And so you go through this period and I thought it was just me until I started talking to people on my podcast more often. And I was so glad to see that it wasn't just me, but also sad because that means other people went through this where um, you actually hang on to your Christianity with for dear life when you're first starting to kind of like deconstruct a little bit and think, mm, this doesn't make sense. You panic, you hang on for dear life and you overcompensate for the thoughts in your head. So I remember I went from being, yeah, I'm a Christian to being, I'm going to post Bible verses on Instagram and Facebook. I'm going to talk about God when it's irrelevant to the conversation, because you basically don't want to be outed as a fraud. You don't want to be outed as like imposter syndrome because you think I'm one of the weak ones that they always warned us about. I can't be one of the weak ones. I have to stay true to my faith and my religion and my God. And this is the hard period they warned you about your whole life. And that's always like kind of the worst period because you don't believe it. You still have those questions. No matter how many verses you post on Instagram, you're still wondering why things don't make sense. But you're afraid to ask anybody because you're afraid that it'll kind of highlight you as an apostate, basically, as like somebody who is not believing. Um, and even though they always tell you, you know, if you have questions, talk to your pastor about it, you you know deep down that certain questions are going to trigger, like, reactions from people. You know, they make it sound like you can ask whatever you want. But certain questions, you know, you just know you can't ask because they're going to be like, why are you, are you thinking about this a lot? Is this something, oh, uh oh, maybe you need to pray some well, more. Well, like, for example, if you ask questions about homosexuality, the assumption is, oh, are you? Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Especially when you got short hair like me. So yeah. So there's like, there's all these, these conflicts you're going through, but because in Christianity, everything is so self-based and self-assigned, you honestly feel like it's your job to get you through this period of questioning and things like that. And so I, when I was around 24 or 25, that's when I really admitted to myself out loud you don't believe this stuff. You've had these questions for years. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and I was on the debate team in college. Um, that's how I like got a scholarship to go to school and everything. So it didn't make sense to me why all during the week I was saying, I need evidence. I need research. I need sources. I need this. But then on Sundays, for I didn't this need one thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And arguably your eternal salvation should be the one thing you have the most evidence. The thing to that's the most important. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so when I was about 24 or 25, that's when I was like, okay, we really need to just call this what it is. You don't believe in God. Is it scary? Yes. What are we going to do about it? I don't know. Um, and then I took shrooms for the first time and that sealed the deal. That sealed the deal. I've never, I, I woke up a different person the next day. Uh, cause I tell people, you know, when you, I don't know if you've ever smoked weed, but when you smoke weed and you have questions and you write them down the next day, you're like, these are the dumbest questions I've ever heard in my life. This is ridiculous. But when I took shrooms that night, I had a lot of questions. I, my brain was going through this kind of exploration. I was writing down these questions and the next day they were still really good questions and I still didn't have the answer, but I knew that I was never going to be able to pretend like the truth wasn't the truth anymore. I'd spent years being like, I don't really believe this, but I'm just going to put that part away because I don't want people to get scared that I'm, you know, falling. And then it went to none of this is real. None of this makes any sense. You've been right all along. You just need to be honest with yourself and the people around you about how you're living your life. Like stop going to church. You haven't liked it in months. It hasn't made sense in months. People are probably starting to notice that you're like different than everybody else. Um, and that's kind of when I understood I'm an atheist and I need to start living the rest of my life as though that is the case and figuring out what that means and what that entails. Wow. Wow, quite quite the journey, yeah. As as I've told you many times before, I can really relate 
to to a lot of it. I think one of the first things that comes to mind, and I think uh, someone in the live chat actually uh, said it, is that this kind of tribalistic view of you know uh, the need for uniformity and control is yes. a lot like the honor culture that's within yep. Islam. I think it's just called something else in in the Western world, but it's essentially the same thing. It is literally the same. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, there. It's interesting how there's this demand for uniformity and yet within that those communities there's all this competition you know yes. what i mean yeah like, like you're saying who's who has the best what well, most well-behaved kids whose husband is has a higher status yes who has the best sunday dress yep and exactly it seems to go counter to that and i wonder if it's just a byproduct of people being suppressed and then just desiring this form of you know self-expression maybe i don't know yeah, I, I think I really humans know. like I, I wonder if humans are just inherently programmed to have a hierarchy. To and so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so even when you say, Oh, there's no hierarchy here, people are still secretly like, Well, my hair's longer. Well, like my eyes are, you know, bluer or whatever. Um, I think humans always need to, even when they swear they don't, they always need to like put themselves above somebody just a little bit, even if it's just in their own mind, they just have to live that way. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe that's just natural instinct. Maybe. Yeah. I, I always wonder about that. And mm. the other thing that I thought was so interesting that you mentioned was how you had this phase where you just kind of course corrected and became, uh, well, visibly anyway, much more religious. Yes. And I didn't really have a phase like that myself necessarily but if you remember i talked about how i felt like i needed to try harder to be yes. muslim because i had grown up in the western world for a while and then i moved back to the middle east and i realized yes. oh i'm way different than everyone else yeah and so i always wonder about people who i see posting christian related memes or they have tiktok channels devoted just to christianity and they're posting every day i ask myself the question what is fueling them is what is, are they being fueled by a genuine desire to help others to spread the message? I'm sure that's part of it, at least to some extent. But I also wonder how much of it is them being motivated to just prove to themselves that they are following their faith properly and that they're very faithful and very reverent of God or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's a combination of both. A because, little bit of both. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because I remember in church there would always be the young girls or the young men who were like praised and like oh they're such like pious young people they're the future of the church they're so great and i remember kind of being jealous of them but also not being jealous of them because i thought it looked really boring it's like oh you read your bible on saturdays ew um but i think also especially Christians, I think they're so, for being a religion where supposedly once you're saved, you're saved forever and you make it into heaven, we still have to ask forgiveness for a lot of stuff, which is odd to me. I've never understood why you can be permanently saved, but also have to ask God forgiveness all the time. And so I think even the Christians who feel like they're the most pious, you know, most followed on their Christian Instagram, I wonder if everybody secretly has that little bit of, but what if this isn't enough? Like, how can I continue to please God more and more and more, create more content, be more visible, be more pious? Nobody will ever think that I've ever questioned anything. Um, and then they just, they just run with that maybe. Uh, you remind me of something I actually saw on TikTok the other day. And it's yet, yet again, one of those things that, like, that makes me think, why am I even on TikTok? But I just find it interesting to keep tabs on what's, you know, culturally relevant, I suppose. Yeah. But it was basically a Muslim TikToker who was announcing how he was competing for donation money with a couple of other prominent Muslim TikTokers. And I mean, it's all for donate, all for charity, but it also makes me wonder, why are you framing it as a competition? I yeah. find those kinds of things so interesting. I mean, is it fueled purely by this desire to help others? Or is there really something like, I need to have more followers, so that proves my faith more. But this is me completely speculating. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like competing, you know, for, for God, essentially, or competing for Allah. Like, are you competing for him? Or are you competing for you? And then also trying to make it 
you know, kill two birds with one stone, also make it more pious because it's for donations. That is always interesting. It, it you, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but whenever people post way too much about how amazing their relationship is, you're like, I feel it's like y'all are thing. probably fighting. It's, it's the same thing. Oh my God. I think everybody knows that couple that is constantly posting pictures of the, of themselves doing all these different things and seeing how much they love each other. Yes. They're, and you're like, it is very suspicious. Maybe like, we're all the, the rocks, cynics huh? and they're they're actually genuinely that happy. I don't know. But I don't know. But it the looks number of breakups that then that, that then happens subsequently is pretty revealing, I'd say. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um yeah, and so I don't I don't know what else. I well, like there was kind of... there was one more thing I wanted to comment on yeah. that you shared about, and then I have a few questions for you. Go and for by it. the way, for everyone watching, if you have any questions for Sydney, please uh, include them in the live chat and I'll collect them and uh, or if you have questions for me too, uh, we'll collect them and then we'll answer them at the very end yeah. of the conversation. And actually, this is a good point to mention that we also have a little poll in the live chat. So the question is, is faith in an organized religion harmful? Yes or no? Yeah. Ooh, I'll be interested to see yeah. the outcome. I guess there's a lot of nuance in that kind of question, but yeah. polls aren't very good at capturing nuance, unfortunately. So I'm curious to hear what the to see what the consensus is. So you can vote for that in the live chat as well. But yeah, so what I wanted to also comment on is so I've also uh, tried shrooms, um, but only after I left Islam. So I, I didn't I didn't have it while I was a Muslim mm. or when I was kind of going in that phase of leaving it. Mm. And the thing I would say, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for, for everyone. No, definitely not um, for everybody. Nope. Yeah. Uh, but what I would say is my, that was my experience and I think is a common experience amongst many people who do try it is what happens is it gives you a new perspective on the same things that you've taken for granted your whole life. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes if you're someone who grew up religious, you start looking at your religion in a different way and ask yourself questions you perhaps never asked yourself before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely would not recommend it for everybody. Um, I also don't recommend trying them while you're watching Hunchback of Notre Dame, the animated movie. It becomes a horror movie very quickly. <laughs> so be very careful um, that I made that mistake once. But yeah, I think it's I think it's less about the shrooms and more about just being the first time you're looking at that angle and looking at that perspective and being confronted with it in a way that you can't just avoid. Absolutely. Precisely. Yeah. And thank you to Gerwak in the live chat, because I always forget to do this. Uh, if you if you're enjoying this conversation, please like this live stream and subscribe to my channel. And I do have a Patreon if anyone wants to support the channel financially yes. as well. So, yeah, thank you for that, uh, Gerwak. And there was something I wanted to ask you um, about your younger period of, of being religious. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's something that you were taught or that you learned about that really stuck with you that was hard to just let go of even towards the end when you're in your early 20s, yeah. mid, mid 20s. Yeah, absolutely. One of the hardest things about deconstructing from religion is understanding some of the things that I said to people and some of the ways that I treated people because I was doing it based on what I was taught at church. Um, so like, I, I always felt like I was a nice person, but I was definitely very judgmental towards people. Um, I remember thinking that if you had sex outside of marriage, you were a bad person. If you dressed revealing, you were a bad person. Um, if you lived with your significant other before you were married, that's not biblical. If you smoked weed, I just remember very much like we were talking about a minute ago. I just remember feeling above so many people at the time. And I remember that was like so important to me. I remember thinking I got to, you know, I have to look good. I have to act well. I have to memorize my Bible verses. I have to do all these things. And in hindsight, none of it was for me and all of it was for what it looked like. And all of it was for how it could make my church proud or my mom proud or um, my religious friends proud. And at the time, I, I thought it was the right thing to do because I was told it was the right thing to do. And, and you get rewarded for those sorts of things like, oh, Sydney's so modest. She's so giving and kind and she's always volunteering. But very much like you pointed out, when I look back on it, I, it was not genuinely 
for Christ or for God. It was all for my image and uh, for how I could look better than other people or how I could be the most pious. And so I have a lot of regret um, on thoughts and and opinions that I voiced on things like purity culture that I don't agree with now at all. I had opinions back then. Sometimes an old Facebook post or something will show up and I'm just like, was that me? Did I say that? It, it's just very um, tough to to go back and and have to say, you know, I know I used to say these things. I know I used to post these things, but I don't believe that anymore. I'm a different person. I've changed my mind. But at the same time, I like being that person who publicly can come out and say, yeah, yeah, I spent 15 years saying these things, you know, 20 years saying these things, but I've changed because I hope that it encourages other people to say the same thing. One of the biggest issues I find with organized religion is that people would rather spend their lives dedicated to something they don't believe than admit they were wrong or they need to change or their past opinion wasn't their current opinion anymore. I've noticed a lot of people would rather just be quiet and stay religious because they don't think it's that bad or it's not really impacting them that much. Um, like a sunk cost fallacy. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. If I stop now, that means I wasted the last 20 years. Would you rather waste 30? Would you rather waste 40? Or would you rather say, hey, I know for 20 years I lived this way. I'm not that person anymore. I'm happy to talk about it. If you have questions, if I hurt you in any way, please like address it with me. I would love to make amends. Um, but I, I think that idea that so many people are more afraid of being wrong and being known as being wrong, uh, they'd rather just keep their mouth shut and pretend like they still believe those things than face the music, I guess. Mm -hmm. The thing that really scares me about that especially is, I mean, it's bad enough when you when you harm yourself doing that. But when I think about people who then have kids and raise those kids yes. while still having that kind of self-denial and then they pass it on to their kids and it just perpetuates generation after generation. Yeah, yeah. One of the number one, I don't want to say arguments, but one of the number one statements that people make um, when they are still Christian or still religious is they say, well, I would rather spend my time doing this and find out it was for nothing and have lost nothing than not follow it and find out I was wrong in the end. And I always disagree with that statement because you lose everything when you stay religious. And even if you somehow make it through 30 years unscathed, you've hurt other people. If you are actually sincerely following your faith and your religion, especially if it's Christianity, that means that you have shamed people. You have told people that other types of people are going to hell. You've told them that if they do the same thing, they're going to hell. You've told them that certain thoughts and ideas that they have are wrong or immoral or unchristian. So you can say all you want, like, oh, I don't lose anything. It's just me. It's basically an insurance policy just in case at the end it's all true. You lose so much and some of it you never even have any idea. If you talk to your friends about how homosexuality is wrong, you have no idea how many of those friends are homosexual when you're having that conversation. You just, you don't know the impact of your words and your actions or how many people you drove away simply because you were so public about being religious. They never got to know you and never talked to you and you could have missed out on some really fantastic friendships. So I don't think there's such a, a way of truly remaining devoutly religious and not losing a lot, either yourself or through others. You remind me of the story of um, a family friend of mine who who is Christian. And what happened to him was, and this was all told to me by my parents. So I always knew this guy as uh, an eternal bachelor, always alone, lives alone. And my parents would often say, well, he's going to also just die alone. And because uh, he's too stuck in his own ways, that kind of stuff. And what yeah. I found out was when he was in his uh, 30s or something, when he was younger, he had this very, very powerful relationship with a woman and they were very close. They loved each other, but he was Christian and she was Muslim and he basically ended it because, wow. because she wasn't Christian as well. And so sad. 
and since then he hasn't been with someone i mean there's a lot of reasons why yeah he, he, but what always stood out to me was that really the only reason he didn't stick with this person who could have been a life partner for the rest of his life was just because she practiced a different religion yeah yeah and then you think what if in 10 years he's not christian anymore you know what if he he finds something else or he has one of those moments where he's secretly been questioning everything then you also threw that away for basically nothing yeah, and so and you're just stuck with regret yeah and i think those are the people that stay christian i think even if he were to wake up one day with a bunch of questions he would stay religious just because he understands that if he doesn't he threw that whole opportunity away for no reason and he'd rather be right and alone than happy and regretful oh i feel so bad for him now yeah 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 me but too who knows maybe I, I haven't heard from him in a while so maybe maybe he's figured stuff out but yeah maybe. yeah maybe, so maybe, he met a nice Christian lady. <laughs> maybe yeah. um there were a few questions about Christianity specifically that I wanted to ask you about as yeah. well. Things I've never really fully understood. So one of my questions was, and this is something I've only encountered within Christianity. I think it does exist in Islam as well, but they just don't call it that. Or maybe it's like a different concept. But what does it mean when a Christian says that they've experienced the Holy Spirit? Did yeah. you ever have this kind of experience? So I thought at the time that I did, but again, hindsight is twenty twenty, and a lot of what they are talking about is the same thing that human beings get when we attend a Taylor Swift concert or when we anything that's that stimulates and excites your body and like produces those chemicals in your brain that bring joy. You can attribute movies to this, music to this, certain types of food to this. So when I talk to Christians about when they've experienced the Lord, what they usually mean is like, there's like a tingling throughout their body and they feel joy and they feel connected to their whole congregation. And they really feel like that, that, love flowing through their body, but it is, it's endorphins. It's endorphins. You know, you can get the exact same feeling from so many other things. Like, like I said earlier, like an amazing concert or something. And so I like to ask people what are moments where they saw God or they felt God. And the majority of the time it's the birth of their first child or their wedding day or looking at a beautiful picturesque thing in nature or having that feeling during um, like hymns being sung. And while I do believe them, I always believe them when they say that that was them feeling God. I know personally that that's not actually what was happening in that moment, but in their mind, that was God. So like, I never think that people are lying to me when they say, you know, oh, this like this feeling is God, this is joy. But I know based on things that I've read and, and studied and, and listened to that that is just hormones doing their thing in your body. Those are just your brain producing the chemicals it's supposed to produce in those moments that make you feel really good. Don't you think there's also an element of it where it's like also wanting to fit in? Yes. I, I have uh, I yes. have a friend who also grew up non-denominational, but was actually Baptist, which made me laugh when you said that, yep. uh, in, in Canada. And she, she told me about these summer camps, these Christian summer camps, where you were supposed to talk about uh, this moment of experiencing Jesus while being in isolation, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And she told me that she wouldn't feel anything, but she would come up with stuff and she'd talk to friends and they said they would make so stuff up too. So whenever I look at, you know, Pentecostal churches and people are, you know, writhing on the ground or uh, yeah. speaking in tongues, I do wonder, is there an element too of, well, others are doing it. So I have to do something as well. 100%. In fact, it might not be voluntary shown, too. It might not right. be. Yes. Yeah. Like studies have shown that people will emulate what's going on in large groups, even if individually they're not, uh, they don't agree or they're not part of that group. It's so interesting. Like I've seen, I've watched videos on this and I've read articles on this where you can pull somebody aside one-on-one -on -one and ask, do you think this? Do you think that? Do you agree with this? Do you agree with that? They'll give you their answers. Then you put them in a room full of people and you say, 
raise your hand if you think this. And that person will look around and then raise their hand, even though they just told you independently that they don't agree with that. Oh, yeah, that kind of thing happens all the time. I think some of it is actually fake, especially in my experience. I remember being so afraid that I wasn't feeling the same thing everybody else was feeling that I was going to play along and I was going to rack my brain for times where I did get that feeling like it's it's possible I've had it before I just didn't get it today for whatever reason maybe I was tired um but, oh yeah but I think I think religion organized religion thrives on that natural instinct to fit in with the group for sure a hundred percent yeah, there's a great point here from uh, Ryan, oh, Ryan in the live chat. Yeah. Uh, who says, if we just would attend weekly music events instead of church, we'd all be happier. That's a great mm -hmm. point. Maybe we can talk about a little bit later. If you, I have a few questions for you first. Yeah. Um, the thing that always interests me as well about people who become atheists, and I always say this, that atheism isn't anything, really. It's just the first step towards, you know, letting go of that belief. But then you... Yeah. You, you have to build a new uh, value system, a new life philosophy, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So what did that journey look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first things that I came to recognize after I left Christianity was that as much as people think they truly believe their religions, I don't think that they do. In my opinion, Belief, true belief is when you have this set of rules that you want to be true and you're given every opportunity to explore the alternative. You can Google your questions. You can attend other types of churches. You can read books. You can do everything you need to do. And at the end, after you've done all this research, maybe it takes a couple of years, you come back and you still say, you know what, though? This still makes the most sense to me, Christianity or whatever. Um so that's what I'm going to go with. To me, that's true belief. What we run into with organized religion that people call belief is they are not allowed to research those things. They are told if they do research those things, that's slanderous towards God. Or even if you're not told directly it's sinful to look at those things, you're, you're implied by leadership that like, hmm, certain questions sound a little bit like the devil. You know, oh, you're questioning that weird. Nobody else questions that. It's just you. That's odd how you would question that, you know? And so I think most people, even the ones who think they truly believe, are operating based on fear. They're operating based on the, the consequences if they were to not take these actions. Now, I do believe Christians and religious people when they say that they believe. I I honestly believe them. And I think that they truly think that they believe these things. But when you really look at what belief is, if you've never been allowed to express any kind of questioning or do a certain extent, uh, research to a certain extent on your questions, and you've been discouraged from looking at alternative answers, I don't think that's real belief. And so my first realization when I was kind of on this journey was, I have never believed this stuff. I've never believed it. When I was a little kid, I remember I didn't actually like going to church on Wednesdays because I never fit in with the other kids. I always felt like all the other kids really had it together. They memorized the verses. They had all this fun. They had all these stories to tell about things their family did that like glorified God. They all just seemed way more talented at being a Christian than I was. And I never felt like I got along with them. I tried to be their friend, but I always felt a little bit weird and a little odd girl out. And I, looking back, I realized I was just confused by everything. I was just confused. I watched Animal Planet. When you tell me that a man was swallowed by a whale, I have questions because on Animal Planet, it says that whales eat krill and they have to come through these little bristles and they're actually microscopic. So it's not that I'm calling you a liar. I'm just curious how Jonah got swallowed by a whale. Like, how did that happen? You know, uh, Noah's Ark, you know, again, I loved Animal Planet. I wanted to be a veterinarian at the time. I knew that every animal two by two could not fit on that boat not calling you a liar. I just want to know how they got that to work. No ventilation system. How did you like, where do they store all the food? Because I had tons of pets. I knew everything that it took to take care of the animals that I had. And they had millions more on that boat. I, I sincerely wanted to know how that worked. 
But in asking those kind of questions, it's made like you're being sarcastic or like you're you're being a jerk by like trying to get people to come up with these answers, which should be a red flag to them. Also, if somebody comes up with a really good question, they're automatically viewed as a jerk. That should be a red flag to you as the person being asked. Um, and like, I remember once uh, when I was in the college age group of church, they separated the men from the women at one point and the men went to one lesson and the women, we were given a lesson by a girl who um, was only a little bit older than us, but because she was married, like in Christian church, that means you like know everything. Um, and she taught us about how a woman's role is to serve her husband and the husband is the head of the household and he makes the spiritual decisions and it glorifies God when you uh, when you follow his lead and how it's not women's job to preach. A woman should not preach in the church. That should be a man. And I raised my hand and I said, what is the difference between what you're doing and preaching? And she was like, well, what are you talking about? Ooh. And, and I was genuinely curious. I was not trying to be a jerk. I was like, I, like you're sitting at the front of the room and you're telling us about how to be better Christians and you're using scripture, you're quoting scripture to kind of let us know as a group how we can be better Christians. What makes this not preaching, but being like everybody being in here together, like the boys and the girls, that would be considered preaching. And she was just like, I'll talk to you about this after class. And like, basically I was told to leave. And so I left. I, I still never found out like what the answer was to that question, but there was like a long pause. And she was like looking at me, like she thought I was trying to be rude. And I, I wasn't, I was just like, that, that it seemed like a valid question, but that's just those types of things. Little by little are the things that make you basically figure out that you need to stop asking questions. Don't, that's bad. Don't do that. And it didn't make any sense to me because I was always praised for being curious, being intellectual, reading so much, getting good grades, yada, yada, yada. But when I applied those exact same things in church, it was like, be quiet. What are you doing? You're trying to cause trouble. Like, what's going on here? Um, and so as I like segued out of religion, I realized, one, I don't think I ever actually believed it. I think I spent my entire life hoping that they would be able to successfully convince me, and they just were never able to successfully convince me. Um, and I also understood that there was going to be a lot of unpacking that I didn't even realize was related to religion at all. And I was really going to have to eat humble pie and let people explain to me things like, your body, your choice. You know, if a girl's dressed a certain way, it's none of my business. You know, if a man is dressed a certain way, none of my business. If a man's dating a man, not my business. Like it, it took a lot of unpacking and I was a very liberal Christian. So I can't even imagine what the deconstruction process is for conservative fundamentalist or evangelical Christians. Um, I'm still unpacking every day. I'm still learning and recognizing every single day, certain things that I used to think were completely unrelated to religion that are directly related to religion. So, so what replaced, uh, those things that Christianity gave you in your life in terms of how did you know uh, the difference between good and evil? Why did you not do bad things? Why yeah. did you focus on doing good things? How do you even know what good is? Uh, how do you find meaning in life? Like, where did yeah. you get those things from? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I think, you know, some things are inherent, like don't kill people. You know, that's pretty decent advice. You know, it never turns out well for the tribe if you kill people. Um, but I honestly had to learn. I, I really had to learn from the ground up that a lot of the things I thought were good were actually harmful. I was lucky. I had a lot of people in my life who were very patient and who had the time to ask the right questions and explain things to me. Uh, for example, when I was in college, you know, I still thought I was just, you know, an untouchable, perfect Christian girl. And I remember I would I would say things and people would just be like, oh, well, why? Or where did you hear that? You know, like what, where did you get that information? And it was, it was just years of me realizing stuff, just years of me being like, oh, 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 you, you have to be willing to be wrong about everything for like three years. You have to go in knowing for the next three years, you're going to be wrong about a lot of stuff. You're going to be called out on it by people who recognize your BS and 
learn from it. And so that was that was really hard because I was so used to, especially from debate, like winning, being right, this and that. And for for like three years, I was just gently put in my place by people. For example, I've used this example before, but to me, it's just one of the best ones that I have from that time. Um, we were talking about um, it was me and a teammate on debate, and we were talking about um, a, like a serial killer that we'd read about or something. And I said, yeah, he probably had her in the basement with like a whole BDSM dungeon, you know, yada, 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 this and that. And she goes, um, actually, BDSM is all about consent. And I said, what? And she goes, yeah, if he kept a girl against her will in his basement, he actually wouldn't be a part of the BDSM community because BDSM is all about like mutual consent and everybody has to consent to everything. And, and there's a lot of um, aftercare and things that are, are honored in the BDSM community. So if he was torturing someone in his basement, that wouldn't be considered BDSM because we wouldn't um, accept him into our community. And I was like, oh. My whole life, I had just been throwing out platitudes like that. Like, oh, you've got a girl chained in your basement, BDSM. Like, I was just throwing out words and, and things that I didn't really understand the implications of until people were there to correct me. You know, and in that moment, I could have been like, yeah, whatever. But instead, you have to take that information and absorb it and be like, oh, I should stop equating BDSM to serial killers. Noted. You know, just that little, just that little exchange, things like that, where um, when I don't know if you remember a couple, like maybe 10 years ago at this point, when a bunch of celebrities had all their nude pictures leaked off their iPhones, their iPhones got hacked and it went viral. And I remember I posted a status where I was like, well, if you stop taking naked pictures of yourself, you don't have to worry about them being on the internet. And people were like, whoa, excuse me, what you do in your privacy, like what you consent to being private does not give everyone the right to access that. Like, so it, you, if you don't want your house, to that was definitely into, the Christian mindset. Right? Yes. Coming yes. In. And I was just so open about it. I just, I posted it on Facebook and I never used to post like stuff like that. I don't know why I chose that moment, but I remember one person was like, so if you own a house, I should get to rob it because you should have thought about that before you bought a house. Oh, you bought the house for you to live in privately. It's Oh, so it's not my business. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, and just moments like that, just years of moments like that, even now, even in the last couple of years, I still run into people who kind of check me and I'm like, oh, that was an interesting lesson to learn. And, you know, there are things that you can take with you and things that you can leave behind. You're allowed to say, you know, I, I still don't agree with that, what you're saying, but I appreciate you sharing your, uh, your perspective with me. But yeah, I think just being ready to be very wrong about a lot of stuff and being willing to sit and listen to what people have to say about certain opinions is the best thing you can do for yourself. You'll learn so much faster. You'll understand other people. It will really make you... Um, I feel like I am so much more accepting and tolerant of other people now that I'm no longer a Christian than when I was a Christian because I'm spending so much time talking to people and really trying to understand where they're coming from and what they're thinking instead of building my Christian argument in my head while they're talking and not really listening to what they have to say or treating it like I'm talking to them because this is my charity as a Christ follower. Like I'm giving them the time of day when nobody else would. That makes me a good Christian. Um, and that kind of thing can make you very ignorant to, to be, to be totally honest. It can make you very ignorant. And, um, one of the best things you can do for yourself is just listen to people prove you wrong on a regular basis and what they have to say. If I was just listening to you and I'm trying to think from the perspective of someone who's religious, I think one of the things they would want to know is, so when you mentioned earlier how, uh, you know, killing people, that's a good inherent rule. Yeah. What they might say is, well, what are you basing that on? Like, what What is stopping you from, what is stopping you from just killing someone who, you know, you could benefit from killing them? Like, you're, yeah. you don't, you don't believe in hell. Uh you don't believe in an afterlife. You don't believe that there's someone watching what you're doing. So why not just do it? Yeah. And that's a great question. And I think that's where I would argue that proves that even atheists have morality. You know, Christians like to say, and religious people like to say, you can't have morality without religion. I don't believe in hell. 
I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe that there is an afterlife there to punish me or reward me. And yet still, if I were to murder somebody, I would not be able to live with myself. I would not be able to sleep at night. And I think that's evidence that whether or not you believe in a heaven or hell, you still have moral values and you still have morality. You know, when I see a human being, I think of them as a son, a father, a husband, a daughter, a sister. And you could, sure, theoretically kill people. And even if, like, let's just say in this instance, I never even got caught. I never even went to jail. I think I would actually be more miserable living with that secret, having never paid the price for that and knowing that I'm not going to pay the price for that afterward, that would honestly make me feel worse personally. Um, And I also struggle to see any instance in which people would benefit from murdering someone. So for example, life insurance, it's like, okay, so you get all the life insurance money. That's great. But if you're the type of person who killed somebody to get that life insurance, you're also probably the type of person who's going to spend it so fast you're in debt five years later already, you know? So like you're still, even if you don't get your comeuppance for that murder, if you're that kind of person, you also make probably a lot of really bad decisions and you're still going to be miserable once you've killed that person who you thought was going to be, you know, your, your leg up in life. Um, but there are certain things like lying, whether you're a Christian or not, your lies usually come back to bite you, right? Even the little ones, even the big ones, um, or you get caught, or even if you don't get caught, it's rare that I've ever told a lie where I'm like, man, I feel great about that. (laughs) Like, I feel great. With the exception of your friend asks you, if they're ugly and you say no, and maybe they really are (laughs) ugly, telling them, you know, lying to somebody about something they can't change might be a good thing. But, um, so sometimes white lies are okay. Yeah. So I, I read something once online that said, if they can fix it in 30 seconds, tell them the truth. If they can't fix it in 30 seconds, lie. So if they're ugly, don't tell them. If their makeup is smeared, tell them. If there's toilet paper on their shoe, tell them. If they just have hideous shoes, don't tell them, you know? Um, but yeah, I think I think that's a great question. And that is something that people ask is they're like, if there's no reward in the end, why wouldn't you do a bunch of stuff? I think that question tells you so much more about Christians than it does about atheists. If your first question for me is why I'm not a rapist and a murderer because there's no heaven, it makes me worry that you're not a rapist and a murderer just because you want to make it to heaven. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe we need those religions to keep those people in check. Yes, like maybe <laughs> you are a good reason why organized religion should stay in it, like popular because you, that's the only reason you're not out here raping and murdering people. I think I, I think it's one of those things that also makes me wonder how much of this is a result of the religious mindset of you can't do all these things where you're going to get the reward, where it teaches the self-denial thing that becomes, as we were discussing earlier, becomes suppression, and mm-hmm. then it comes out in the exact opposite of the intended way Yeah, just because yep. of that. So I, I, I do wonder about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that whole suppression thing, when your entire religious belief is based on suppression, at what point do you recognize things that you're suppressing that you should not suppress? At what point are you allowed to be concerned and maybe see a therapist or something like that? You're so used to suppressing things um, that, that would otherwise bring you joy on earth. How do you know when something you're suppressing is actually dangerous and you should tell somebody about it and you should address it, you know? For sure. Yeah. There's, there's one more thing I think a Christian would want to ask mm-hmm. that came to mind to me. And it was when you were talking about how you don't think you really had that full on unwavering faith. Mm-hmm. I think some Christians might say, well, that just proves that you were never a true Christian. You mm-hmm. never truly accepted Jesus into your heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, would, you would have abandoned baby Jesus if you, if you had the opportunity. Yeah. So why should we listen to you about when you talk about Christianity? You never actually experienced it or lived yeah. it. Yeah. And that's actually that would actually be a great question, too. I think the reason that people should listen to that message is because even if they think that it doesn't apply to them, even if they're like, no, no, I truly believe like I am pious. I am a perfect Christian. They need to understand that people who feel that exact same way are preaching in the pulpit are passing the um, the offering plate. There are people in their church who are shaming them for behaviors that 
don't actually believe any of that stuff, but they have to actively be saying certain things in order to kind of cover up their their issues. And so maybe they maybe they think they shouldn't listen to me and that's totally fine. But as a Christian, I would think that you would want to know every type of person you might come in contact with. Uh, you might want to have answers ready to go for people like me or if you are truly a, a, a if you are truly a pious Christian, shouldn't your first question be how can I help people like her as opposed to I'm not going to listen to people like her because she doesn't know what she's talking about. You would think that your first response would be I need to learn more about this so I can help people because it sounds like that was a really tough thing to go through and I would love to help people like her be led to the Lord so that they don't end up a YouTube atheist, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and <laughs> um uh I think that's really well said. I completely agree with you. And it's this is something I hear from Muslims all the time uh, as well, by the way, that you were never tr truly a Muslim. I would say in my case that I genuinely do feel that I had the full faith for a yeah. long time. Mm -hmm. But again, that won't satisfy some Muslims because I ended up leaving. So how could yeah. I possibly have had it? Yeah. 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 And, and I went through a period when I was maybe nine or 10 where I was borderline evangelical like i truly i was steeped in it i was just i feel like kids go through that i feel like when we are introduced to a religion it's like our for whatever reason we just dive in head first we want to be the best at it um so i i would say that when i was a kid i was a true christian i was i just ate it all up i absorbed it i loved it i i was all about it it's when you become older and you start having questions that's when you start to say I don't think I really am one of these anymore. You know, I don't think I, I don't think I believe this anymore. I genuinely did before, but in hindsight, I recognize that all the issues I was running into were based on the fact that my questions just were never getting answered. And I still had those questions and I wasn't going to let those questions go. I was just going to try and figure out if maybe there's a different place for me to find those answers. And I don't think that I was a true Christian the last 15 years that I was in it. But I wanted to be and I tried to be and I did all the work and I did everything you were supposed to do in order to really feel God's grace and God's presence. And it just it never happened, you know. Mm. Well said. Yeah. Uh, a, a good comment here. Good quote from friend of the channel, Connor Phillips. If the only thing keeping a person decent is the expectation of divine reward, then brother. That person is a piece of shit. Yeah. Oh, that's truly, from True though. Detective. Yeah. Connor is yeah. obsessed with True Detective. Thanks for that, yeah. Connor. True Detective is a good show. But yeah, I mean, if you ask somebody what keeps you from being a murderer and they say jail, be concerned. <laughs> be concerned. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. While all of this was happening, what was and and it became more clear mm -hmm. to you that you're you're no longer Christian and then you actually left. What was your family's reaction to all of this stuff? So this, okay, so this usually surprises people, but I don't think they know. I haven't hidden it. To this it. day. To this day. To this day. I have not hidden it. I have not lied have about it. Have they not visited your website where you have a exactly. podcast called? Exactly. <laughs> that tells me for almost two years, they have never listened to a single, po they just like the post. That... I had a moment the other day, like two months ago, where I realized that and I laughed my ass off like all day long because my mom had said something where I was like, she, she's never listened to my podcast. She's never, she's, she's never watched one of my videos. Um, so yeah. 100 so I, episodes and congratulations, 100. by the way. Thank you. Uh, hitting that landmark recently. Thank you. Thank you. And like live streams and guest appearances on other channels. And that's like, I realized like my family's not watching any of it. They're just supporting it. They're just like, yay, good for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's not something that I've ever been secret about. But one of the things, one of the things I learned when I was a Christian that have actually been handy as an atheist is I remember my mom telling me, you know, if you are trying to get somebody to come to church with you, if you want to lead them to the Lord, be kind, be yourself, be fun, be a good friend, be there for them, and then let them find out you're a Christian. And when they realize they really like you and you're a Christian, maybe they want to be a Christian too. And then they'll come to church and they'll realize that I feel the same way about being an atheist outside of my channel. 
outside of like YouTube, I never talk about it. I don't bring it up. It's not really a big part of my identity. If somebody asks, I'm honest with them, but I don't walk around being like, hello, I'm an atheist. Oh, also my name is Sydney. Um, because I, I want that same impact. I want people to think she's funny. She's nice. She's engaging. She makes everybody feel welcome. And she's an atheist. I thought atheists were bad people. Okay, I'll, I'll listen to a couple episodes to see what this is about or something, you know, something like that. Um, I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> just, just, I think you answered it. I mean, oh, it's the just family. about Does yeah. my family know? Yeah, so yeah. I guess they just don't. They just, they, I mean, if they were to ask me straight up, like, are you an atheist? I'd be like, yeah, but at the same time, I'm not going to like bring it up at Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to okay. be like, I'm leaving the room for the prayer because this isn't real to me, you know? <laughs> I think this is a good point for me to just mention to everyone, if you have any questions for Sydney about anything, and if a few of you have asked questions, thanks, Gerwalk. There's a bunch of questions from Gerwalk uh, as well. Uh, ask away in the live chat, and yeah. we're going to cover them at the end of, of the live stream. Yeah. I think for this next section, what I was wanting to ask you about was what you do uh, I guess it's connected to your podcast, but what you do for a living, I found this so interesting about you is um, how did you end up being a comedian? Yeah. So a lot of people are very surprised to find out that I, I so I've been doing comedy for 16 are years. Are people surprised? Like what? Sydney's the least funny person I know. <laughs> exactly. Look, this girl, women aren't funny. Um, they're surprised to find out that I was a Christian and a comedian at the same time for so long. And that I was able to like compartmentalize those two parts of my brain and my life. Would you, would um, you, when, so you were a comedian even when you were Christian? Oh yeah. I've been would doing comedy for 16 jokes? years. Okay. All right. Would you make jokes about Christianity when you were Christian? No, I wouldn't. Um, it never occurred to me until like this year that I never once talked about my faith or leaving my faith as part of my standup. I think it was so compartmentalized in my life. It never even occurred to me to make one part of the other. Um, but so I started doing standup when I was in high school. I moved to Chicago, Illinois when I was in high school from Arkansas. And I started doing improv at the Second City in Chicago. It's a comedy theater there. They actually have one in Toronto as well. Um, and they do. then I started doing stand-up as well. And I just fell in love with it. I just, it was what I wanted to do with my life. It, it made so much sense in terms of like my sense of humor, what my interests were. Because up until then, I'd never really had an outlet for the the things I was interested in other than maybe drama and I didn't like playing other characters I'm not a good actress at all I'm not an actress <laughs> at all um so when I was first introduced to stand-up I just took off I was like this is what I want to do with my life um and I realized the other day I've actually been alive as a comedian longer than I was alive not as a comedian which is very strange to to think about but man I remember there was a show at Second City that was on Sunday mornings which in hindsight, I'm like, who goes to see stand up on Sunday mornings? But it was a very popular show. And I would do comedy in the morning. And then I would go to church afterward. It was very strange. Like when I look back on it, I'm like, that is very strange. Um, and yeah, it was just I so I started doing stand up in high school. And now I, uh, I still do stand up and you know, TikTok and, and all that stuff. But I also teach classes. So I teach storytelling classes, I teach public speaking, uh, stand up comedy classes at a theater here. Um, I'm no longer in Chicago. I'm in Nashville at this point. But yeah, so that's during the day I, I teach um, and I perform and do podcasts and TikToks and things like that. But oddly enough, that had almost no impact whatsoever on my journey. The only way that it really impacted me at all is on Sundays, all the other comedians would be like, oh, what are we doing? And I would go to church. And I remember the day that we did our Sunday show, we were leaving and I said, where are we going? And everybody paused and they looked at me and they're like, you're not going to church this morning? And I was like, no. And they were just like, oh, okay. And they never roasted me about it. Never asked a couple of people years well, later. Well, God is going to roast you later on. Yes, he's going to roast me literally and figuratively. Um, you know, that that would actually be kind of wonderful if hell was like for me, if like hell was designed for me, was just me being roasted by a bunch of people for eternity. Just being like this dumb bitch. <laughs> While you're dying. actually being while yeah. i'm honest bit just yeah. like over the flames <laughs> double roasted that's hilarious um but yeah and so it was so weird because one part of my life i was figuring out like 
what am I doing with my eternal salvation? And then the other part of my life was, I got a show on Thursday, come out and see it if you want. Um, And they never, those two sides never, until I started the podcast, really never converged. And I feel like now I am very grateful for that experience because I feel like it's helped me a lot in terms of engaging with guests and strangers. When you've been doing internet content and comedy for, you know, 16 years, you've seen it all, you've heard it all, you've been called it all. There's nothing that somebody can say or do that's not, you know, that you haven't heard before. Or if you have, you're just impressed. You're not even offended by it. You're like, that was really good. Um, so yeah, they, they never, those two sides never had anything to do with each other until I started the podcast in 2021. And I didn't realize that was weird until then. And now I think about it all the time. Now I'm like, how did I do that? I, I don't know that I'd be able to go back and do that again. Out of curiosity, do you do, do jokes about Christianity now? Now I, no, I still don't. I don't. I think it's because one, I just never really think to. Like when I think of stuff that's funny, I think of, um, I do a lot of self-deprecating humor. I talk about my family a lot. I talk about being from Arkansas a lot. Um, but I think, I still am very aware of how sensitive that can be to people and how, um, you know, when I, when I was first deconstructing. You mean religion specifically? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and leaving religion, there are some people who, um, they don't, they don't want to be on the podcast because they're still so confused about where they are in life and how they feel about religion that maybe I've talked to enough people to understand that that, like, that wouldn't necessarily be funny. Um, or maybe, I don't know, or maybe I talk about it so much during the day that I don't want to talk about it <laughs> at I, night. I can something. totally understand that. I'm yeah. not sure. There's not like a, there's not a definitive rule I'm following there. But if I had to guess, it's probably just because I talk about it so much that I don't want to talk about it even more during that time, maybe. I don't know. Huh. That's a good well, question. Well, well, for, well, maybe, maybe something you can think about afterwards. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Maybe um, I'll write a whole set about it. <laughs> Well, uh, for me, like how I found the best way to express myself was by writing. Mm, and yes. So what I wanted to know, because I mean, I've never really tried doing comedy or stand up. Uh, I think there was this one phase where I really liked the idea and I came up with like a five minute routine yeah. that yeah. will that will never be heard. by in the <laughs> Never public see anyway. the light of day. <laughs> no. Um, what about stand up is the thing that really spoke to you as this is the way I want to express myself? Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think where it all started. So I knew that I really liked making people laugh. And I knew that I also didn't like reading scripts and things like that because I never felt like it connected to any of it. Um, and I did a lot of when I was a kid, I would do a lot of like character voices and stuff like I was always just trying to make people laugh. But there never seemed to be an outlet that catered to that. It's like you were in drama, so you could play a character. Um, so you could, you know, be somebody else for a second, but I didn't really want to be anybody else. Um, and then I, I figured out like Comedy Central became very popular around the time that I was 14 or 15. And I loved Saturday Night Live. And so I thought, oh, I know, I want to be on Saturday Night Live. Maybe that's what I'll do. So that's when I started doing improv, because we learned that most of the people from Saturday Night Live come from the second city in Chicago. And that's actually why we moved to Chicago. Um, I I owe everything to my mom because she literally dropped everything and moved to Chicago for me when I was in high school so that I could start taking improv there. And because she knew I was serious about comedy and things like that. Um, but I think when I was introduced to stand up, I recognized that that was the platform that met all of the things that I felt like I wanted to do. You know, it's you're by yourself. You don't have to worry about being on a team. Being on a team always makes me nervous because if I'm the weakest link, you know, I'll ruin it for everybody. But if I ruin it for me and I'm the only one on stage, I just say goodbye and I leave and I never have to see any of these people again. Um, and so I think, I think it just gave me an outlet to really work on humor and writing. I love writing. Um, I'm getting my master's right now in creative writing. And um, I knew, do, do you know who David Sedaris is? Have you? Yes. 
So he was like my idol. David Sedaris was my idol. But I didn't know what to call what he did when he read his work on stage. Like, what do you even call that? I had no idea. And so when I was introduced to stand up and to storytelling, I realized I was like, that's what he's doing. He's storytelling. He's just reading his written stories to people on stage. They're loving it. They're selling out the house. He's making us all laugh. But he's not doing anything else. He doesn't have, you know, pyrotechnics or tricks or anything. He's literally just standing there making us laugh with his words. And so um, he was like, he was kind of the first person I'd ever seen do that. And so that was, I knew that was the direction I wanted to go in. And so once I got involved and I started feeling like it really was, it, it was very natural for me to be a part of, I just stuck with it. I just, you know, and you... And stand-up is one of those things where it's it's like any other relationship. Sometimes you love it. Sometimes you hate it. Sometimes you want to quit. Sometimes you never want to do it again. But the minute anybody else starts talking bad about it, you're like, how dare you? How dare you say what I just said yesterday? <laughs> like, um, yeah. And so I, I, I don't know. It's just been a big part of my life. And now at this point, I don't know who I would be without it, to be honest, if I were to stop forever of entertaining in some to some degree. I don't know what I'd be like. Well, I'm glad you found it. That's that's amazing. I really, yeah. I really, I really admire whenever someone takes on an artistic field, a creative field, especially in this day and age, because there it always is a risk, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is because I think mm -hmm. you you can kiss security and stability uh, goodbye taking yes. on those kinds of jobs. Yes, and you have to have a thick skin. You have to have a thick skin because no matter how good you are at it, there will be people who actively try to make you feel bad about it. And one of my favorite things about teaching classes is I teach only adults. I don't teach like kids. I don't even know that kids stand up exist, which is probably a good thing. Um, uh, but being the first person to tell somebody they're funny ever in their whole life and watching that like settle into their mind is just awesome. It's just so cool. I have people who are in my class that are retired and they're like, you know, when I was a teenager, I thought this would be fun. But then I, I started the nine to five grind and never really thought about it again. Um, yeah, retirees who are now writing jokes, you know, people in their 20s and 30s, just being the first person to be like, man, you are so funny. Let's work on this and make it just like a, a really great set for you. Um, I feel like it's kind of passing the torch because I was supported and I was taken seriously and I was allowed to explore that area of my life. You know, I never had parents who told me that's like a useless thing to do. What Now I did have, my mom did explain, you still need a, a real job for a while until it picks up. Like, don't, please don't be homeless living in my basement, trying to make it as a comedian, like get a regular job, but also pursue comedy until it's enough that you don't need a regular job. Um, and, but it, to find out how many people had spouses even that were like, you're not funny. Like, don't do that. That's a waste of your time. It's just, wild. It's just wild. And so because I never had to live in an environment like that, I was always supported and told I could do whatever. It's really important to me that I also be that way for people, whether it's in comedy or deconstruction, even through the podcast. I always want to be like that person who supports whatever it is you're trying to do as long as it's not murder. I still am not a fan of murder. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. On the record for that, for sure. When it comes to the podcast, you mentioned that you started in 2021 and mm -hmm. Uh, the link for the podcast is in the video description. It's called Growing Up Fundy. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to do the podcast and about that subject specifically of talking to people about religion? Yeah, great question. Um, so I, I got COVID over Christmas in 2021 for the very first time. So I had like two weeks where I just wasn't allowed to do anything or go anywhere. And I was telling somebody about growing up with the Duggars. I was like, yeah, this, this and that. I was telling them about uh, being Baptist in the South and stuff like that. And they were like, have you ever told anybody else this stuff? And I said, no, I haven't. And they're like, you should. This is very strange, but interesting at the same time. Like as somebody who didn't grow up in the South religious, this is wild stuff. You should tell somebody about it. And so I thought, you know, I'd always wanted to start a podcast, but I never, I didn't want to be one more comedian with a podcast about comedy, you know, and I tried like 10 different kinds of podcasts and none of them ever took off, but I was like, okay, yeah, I'll start a podcast on this. Why not? And so I made the first episode about you know, growing up with the Duggars and being religious and things like that. Um, and when I posted it, a bunch of people that I had known for years were like, hey, I was a fundy as well. Um, 
do, can I be on your podcast and tell you about it? Yeah, sure. Of course. I had no idea. And then it just opened the floodgates by the second episode, maybe just busted open how many people I knew that I had no idea had grown up in really strict religious households, gone to religious schools their whole life, had like no contact with their family whatsoever because they deconstructed and they left. We never talked about those things. And some of these people I had known for 10 years. And that's when I realized, oh, like this isn't a joke. This is something that a lot of people have been through. And so then I started wondering if this has happened to so many people I know through Christianity, how many people has this happened to through all the different religions? How many people do I know are ex-Muslim or anything like that? And so that's just, it just kind of took off from there. So many people were like, oh, a place to talk about it, a place to tell my story. I would love to. And because so many people I know are writers, comedians, actors, whatever, they were very engaging on camera. They were very friendly. They were entertaining to listen to. And so it became a friendly, funny place. You can talk about your worst traumas. And it just took off from there. And then people who I'd never met before started reaching out and saying they were interested in being on it. And that's when I developed that little web form where people can submit to be a guest. So if anybody watching this is interested in being a guest, I have a web form you can submit to. I would love to hear your story. Um, and it and just, the web form is also the video description, everyone, if you want to yes, check it's it a, out. The yeah. Google form. Um, and it just, it it really hit me how, one, lucky I am that I live in a society where I can talk about things like this openly and not be condemned to death, literally. Um, but two, it just made me realize that there were so many people that need to talk about it and they need to listen to people talking about it. And they, they need a place to go where they recognize they're not the only ones feeling these things. And it became so much more important. You know, it started off as like, hey, let's all just chit chat and talk about this. But then it really became important to me to have a spot where people could, even if they were still too shy to talk about it, they could go and they could listen to other people talk about their experiences and understand that there is there is absolutely life after you leave these things. And it can be a really great life, actually. Wonderfully said, really. Thank you. And I think... <laughs> What I have in common with you, especially in our approaches, is that even though we have our, you know, experiences that have, I would, I would say it's fair to say it's biased us against our religions that we grew up in, mm -hmm. and we do have our bias against religion, mm -hmm. we're both, uh, and you're especially, very open to hearing what anyone has to say, mm -hmm. and you listen with an open mind, which I think is what we really need in the domain of religion, because everyone is so defensive and... Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of anger to go around on yes. on both sides. Yes. For religious people, I think it's because they feel like, for example, the anecdote you mentioned where you asked that question about, well, aren't you preaching to us? Mm -hmm. I think that person felt personally attacked, most likely. Very I think much. That's often the case with religion, where if you talk about it, they feel attacked. And so yes. their backs are up and then they become very aggressive. Yes. And then same thing for... Uh, someone who left a religion, it's something that caused them so much pain, so much suffering. And so yes. when they see someone defending this religion, they, you know, they just lash out. They and do. Mm -hmm. I, I think all those motivations are understandable. I think you would agree with me on that. Yeah, absolutely. But the, but the key is to kind of just listen to the other side and just take the time to understand where they're coming from. Because when you understand where people are coming from, you'll see that there's a lot of common ground and sometimes yeah. things just come down to really simple misunderstandings. Yes. That being said, there's some people that you just can't, <laughs> that you can't reason you, with them. You can't reason with them no matter what side they're on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I also, especially with religion, because so much of religion is don't think about it, don't question it, just believe it. People I've found with religion and with politics, when you ask somebody the reason why, why anything they make a statement and you say oh really why or where did you get that they take the question why as you calling them stupid and they react accordingly or if you ask a question that they don't know the answer to instead of saying that's a really great question and i don't have the answer to that but i would love to find it and share it with you if you would just give me some time to find the answer to this question um they instead their knee-jerk reaction is to say how dare you get out of here go away 
instead of, hmm, that's a really good question. And that's why it's so important to me that people understand half the process is being wrong so often because you can either be that person who shuts down and is like, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. I have my beliefs and those are real. Or you can be the person that's like, I've never thought about that before, actually. I'm going to need some time to think about that. Great question. I have no idea. To me, admitting when you don't know something makes you so much more trustworthy than always having an answer prepared for everything. Yeah, I don't I don't know is I think something that I've always been comfortable with saying, but it really is in a way braver than just claiming something. Yeah, yeah. To just absolutely. admit you don't know is something a lot of us are afraid of. And it doesn't just uh, restrict itself to religion. I think it's true for a lot of lot of subjects. Yes. Yes. Yeah. People are always surprised. It shows weakness, out. I think. That's what yes. people believe. Yes. Yes. And they're always surprised to find out that one, you admit when you don't know something. And two, you know, people come at you with those theoreticals where they're like, well, what if science one day proves that there's a God? What are you going to do? Because you believe science. And I say, then I guess I would believe there was a God. I'd have questions. I'd be a little upset. I'd I feel like I would have some very valid questions for God, but they they are always surprised when you say like I don't know. I guess under that circumstance, I would have to then believe there was a God because that's what science says. You know, I wouldn't do what he said. I'd be a little miffed. I'd think he was an asshole, but <laughs> he'd be real, and I'd have to believe it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing the the podcast for I guess almost two years now. Almost, yeah. It'll be two uh, years at Christmas. Amazing. Do you have any future goals with it? Uh, do you envision doing anything kind of bigger along those lines? Uh, what are what are you thinking about doing in the future? Um, so I've had a lot of really cool opportunities come to me through the podcast, through like guests, you know, like Secular Rarity, putting me in touch with people like you, with things that I otherwise probably would not have gotten to be a part of, but. I have goals like, for example, I want to make sure that it's always free to access. I never want people to have to pay money to access the content. Because, um, you know, there's there are platforms like uh, Apple has Wandry, where if you sign up for their Wandry subscription, you get access to more podcasts or more episodes or things like that. Um, I never want to charge for the content because I think it's too important to be inaccessible to people who can't afford to access it. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know. I, I got to speak about podcasts at Secular Student Alliance this summer, which was really cool. I would love to do more stuff like that. Um, speaking engagements. I love hosting um, live streams and things like that. So I think the official answer, answer to that question is there's nothing that I would turn down, I think, if it's related to, like, hey, I found you on the podcast. Do you want to be a part of this thing? Um, yeah, I'll pretty much be accepting of any cool opportunities that come my way awesome yeah yeah and, and just looking to the future again how do you envision you know the whole landscape of talking about religion and leaving religion is going to look like in the coming years i mean i would say definitely compared to even just 15 years ago it's much more of an open subject that's just out there on the internet mm -hmm. So, yeah, what do you think that's going to be in like another 10, 15 years? I think um, so statistically, at least in the United States, statistically, the people who are the most religious are the boomer generation and older. You know, Gen X, they're pretty religious. Millennials and Gen Z are leaving religion in droves. Uh, you know, they, there are examples of like millennial churches and churches are getting cooler and hipper and their music's getting a little more, you know, uh, like mainstream. But I think we will find, one, that everyone who we thought was religious this whole time actually wasn't, but they weren't allowed to talk about it or they were afraid to talk about it. I think we'll find more and more people being honest about it. I think we'll find more and more people being open about it. I hope that we begin to elect non-religious people into office in the next few decades. I hope that is no longer a, um, a stigma, I guess. And I think as the older generations die out, we will find that North America becomes much more like Europe in their um, secularity, you know, especially in like Scandinavian countries. You just really don't hear about them being religious all that much. Even if they identify with a religion, you really just don't hear about religion having anything to do with their laws, anything to do with their health care, anything to do with their education system. And so I think what we will run into, at least in the United States, is 
for the next like 10 years, people will really crack down on forcing Christianity on everyone. They'll try to pass laws. They'll try to change school curriculums. They'll try to change as much as they possibly can because these older generations are on their way out and they're freaking out because they see that we're all leaving, we're questioning, we're changing. And then after that, I think, I hope we will see so much more like I I pray for a world where my podcast is not unique in any way, right? And when I say pray, you know, I don't mean like religiously, but it, and those are the little things, like those little phrases, like I pray this or I'll pray for you. And you're like, what am I talking about? Um, but I like, my dream is to have a world where nobody listens to my podcast anymore because every everyone is secular. Everyone has deconstructed and nobody's facing religious trauma anymore. Um, and I know that's forever away, but my goal is that people are so open and so willing to talk about it and share their experiences and explain to other people it's perfectly okay to leave religion, that my podcast is one of 150 million just like it. And it's no longer a touchy subject, I guess. Wow. I hope so too. Yeah, I think it's going to take a bit a bit of time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll <laughs> but, be old. I'll be yeah, old yeah, by then. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things where I feel like every conversation matters. So this one matters, and then yes. the ones that result from this matter, and then it kind of builds slowly and steadily mm -hmm. from there. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So for for anyone watching who's questioning their faith, what piece of advice would you give them? That's a really good question. Um, I would say question everything. I tell this to my Christian listeners. I tell this to my atheist listeners. I tell this to people who are on the fence. Question everything that you are told. Research everything that you are told. Reject the idea of blind faith in any regard, whether it's religiously, whether it's socially, because the training that you get in church to ignore a lot of stuff and just focus on faith, that can harm you in many facets of life that can harm you romantically when you're ignoring red flags about people because for whatever mm -hmm. reason you think you're supposed to be with them you don't notice things when maybe you're buying a house that should be a red flag because you're just supposed to have blind faith like why would your realtor lie to you um so question everything you deserve to not be ashamed of researching wondering experimenting it's okay it is perfectly okay to learn that everything you thought you believed isn't at all what you believe. You know, there was a time in my life where I truly thought that I was a Christian Republican girl. Like I thought that was my whole thing. And it turns out I am an atheist, liberal, Democrat, you know, snowflake. Um, and, and that's okay. So if anything, I would just say, make sure you're safe. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there are households and areas where questioning your faith isn't it doesn't leave you in the safest environment so just make sure you're safe when you're doing this whether you have to use like a library computer or something like that but never allow somebody to just tell you something is right and not question it and research it and look it up whether it's at school whether it's in church whether it's something your parents say whether it's something your grandpa says if anybody ever says anything with absolutes look it up double check question everything. And anyone who is upset with you for questioning those things is somebody you should also be wary of, even if it's just at an information standpoint. You know, your grandma may be the nicest person on earth, but don't believe anything she says. If <laughs> She says everything like it's 100% backed. Um, that's probably what I would say, because you can't make people deconstruct just like you can't make people lose weight. You can't make people work out. You can't make people quit cigarettes. It has to be their idea and it has to be on their time and their, their pace. Same thing with information. Just Google everything that you're questioning and you will be shocked to find out how often you are fed incorrect information. Or you might find out that it actually is the truth and you're very interested and you fall down a rabbit hole looking at that information and now you feel, um, you should feel, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You should feel glad and grateful anytime you're proven incorrect. Don't feel stupid. Don't feel dumb. Don't feel ignorant. Be like, wow, I'm glad I didn't spend one more day in my life saying these things out loud, knowing how wrong I am. 
it's a it's an it's, it's best to see it as an opportunity to learn yes rather yes. than like being worried about your ego being you know bruised exactly don't let your ego keep you from learning things that might actually fascinate you and interest you in a big way well thank you so much sydney like really well said again thank you um thank you. this was a real pleasure and i really recommend to anyone to check out sydney's podcast and said you're you're active throughout social media as well mm -hmm. Uh, yep. all, all the links, again, are in the video description. And if you are interested in talking about your own religious experiences, whether you are still religious or you've left religion, there's a Google form also in the video description if you want to join uh, Sydney's podcast and appear there as a guest. Yeah. And Yay. so we're at the end now. And uh, again, if you like this discussion, please like this live stream and subscribe to the channel. I'm hoping to get more guests like Sydney talking about different religions besides Islam very soon. I think I saw someone recommending uh, talking to an ex-Catholic, yeah, uh, which yep. which would be interesting. I I've always wanted to ask someone who knows more about about the, the Trinity because I find that really fascinating. And I've I've heard Christians, Catholics talk about it, and I still feel like I don't uh, fully fully understand it. You know, I <laughs> was supposed to believe it and I still don't understand. Quite yeah, what yeah, it's is. it's one of those things where to me, I mean this 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 is a subject for another video, but I feel like it's filled with contradictions, but the contradictions yes. are are kind of part of it because God transcends contradictions. So it's it's really convoluted. Yes. But yeah. Yes. So, uh I hopefully uh, an an ex-Catholic would be interested in coming on the channel to talk about that. Yeah. And yeah, so let's see the results of the the poll question. So I think you can still vote. Yeah, you can still vote if you want, everyone. So the question was, uh, it's in the live chat, is faith in an organized religion harmful? So 85% said yes, and 15% said no. Interesting. Yeah. I would be interested to hear from the people who said no and what the what their experiences or what their thoughts are on that or why they voted no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If any of you who voted no are here, feel free to to talk about it in the live chat or in the comments after the video is over, after the live stream is over. And yeah, let's get to a few questions from people. We actually got quite a few questions. So so this one is just for me. I'll quickly address it. So uh, Hamza, hello, Hamza says, why is there no option to do super chats and pay like with apostate Aladdin, who's another uh, ex-Muslim YouTuber? Well, the simple answer is I think I am eligible to do super chats now, but I wasn't for a long time. And I mean, I'm kind of like Sydney where um, I'm not really doing this for the money. Uh, I have a day job as well. It would be nice to be able to do this as my full time thing. Mm -hmm. um, nowhere near that yet. And so I just haven't gone around to it, to be honest. I do have a Patreon, which you can uh, subscribe to. Uh, it's in the video description, too. But maybe I should just, you know, take the time and effort to actually add the super chat. But yeah. yeah. So thanks for that question, Hamza. So let's see. Uh, questions for you, Sydney. What's a good one? All right. So this one's from Gerwak. Uh, Gerwak says, thanks for speaking. And what did you think of other Christians from, I guess, different denominations, maybe, who held different beliefs than you did? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the things I learned after leaving is how much Christians judge other Christians. And I realized I used to do it all the time, too, and I, I didn't know that I did that. For example, when I was Baptist, we thought the Pentecostals were crazy. Like, why are you speaking in tongues? Why are you waving your hands? Like, why do you some of those denominations who like bring snakes to church? It's like, what's that? Those are crazy people. Or the ones whose like hair is all the way down to their knees. Like, whoa, those are crazy people. We thought, you know, just like establish a relationship with God, be saved, you know, be a good person. But yeah, we, we definitely thought that there were certain people who were very culty one of my favorite things about leaving religion is not understanding that you were also in a cult the whole time um, and like judging other people for being involved in cults, not realizing that you are literally steeped in a cult. But because it's not like TV makes cults look because there's no like evil man who looks like a wizard who's ruling the whole thing, you don't realize you're in a cult. So yeah. Oh yeah. We thought that there were some Christians who are a little bit nuts 
we thought that Catholicism involved a lot of stuff that was totally unnecessary, right? Like, why do you have to confess your sins to a priest? Why do you have to do the Hail Mary? Um, I remember people used to say, if you're just reciting a prayer that was memorized, that you were told you had to say, that's not really praying. That's just memorizing like a poem. Um, so yeah, we definitely had thoughts and opinions on other religions and how much better we were than them because we did things differently. Um, but we weren't like mean to them. It was just like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just have to do our own stuff. That's yes, kind of yes. yeah, mm -hmm. crazy if you look at it from another perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also learned from guests afterward that apparently Baptists are not real Christians at all. Like Baptists are frowned upon as like the, the liberal wannabe fake Christians, which is shocking to me because with the amount of like religious trauma that I have, and I wasn't even apparently a real Christian, I can't even imagine what it's like for real Christians. <laughs> Uh, the, the, there's uh, one person who actually took the time to explain why they said no to the poll question. So Zagro says, I voted no. The religious impulse is very much evolutionary. Can't really make a proper case in the chat, though. Fair enough. Um, yeah. And that's if you've ever read the book, uh, Why We Believe in Gods by J. Anderson Thompson. Very short, very quick read. Life changing. He talks about that exact same thing. About that how, exact thing. That exact thing about how... Um, the belief in God was actually evolutionary beneficial for human beings to survive. Um, yeah. So I completely agree with that answer. Yeah. Interesting. There mm -hmm. was this question for you. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Um, the question was, why do you think people are religious or become religious? Yeah. So I think that religion is one of those things where people are always looking for some place to belong. I think lots of people thrive when they're given instructions to follow. Um, and so when somebody comes to you and they say, these are the rules, do this, focus on these rules, and you will be considered a good person, you'll be doing the right thing. I think a, a vast majority of people are so relieved that they are no longer in control of their life and their choices. They have rules to follow. And even when they're not a big fan of the rules, at least they don't have to blame themselves for anything. You know, you're not to blame if you think church is boring, but you go and you follow the rules and you do what you're told. And you can mark that off your list as done, good Christian, follow the rules. So I think very much in the way that fraternities and sororities operate, very much in the way that a lot of groups and clubs, even, you know, CrossFit, the way that they operate is they say, we give you a place to belong, we give you a membership, we give you rules to follow, and then we praise you when you follow those rules, and we make sure to make a big deal when you're doing things right. Um, I honestly, it's like, why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? I would love to be a part of a group that just loves me for the sake of following the rules, you know? Yeah, and especially if you believe that those rules are coming from the creator of everything yep. who also loves you. Yes, the divine. And it's like, I totally understand why people would want to believe that their loved ones are waiting for them in heaven and like celebrating and partying and they're going to see them again. It makes perfect sense to me why you would hope that's the the real way things are. Mm -hmm. There's this one question from Harrisbex. Um, Did you look into any other religions when you left Christianity? Also, is there anything that you miss about it? Yes, there, man, there is a whole chapter of my life where I almost converted to Judaism for somebody, uh, which was very interesting. But it was my research into Judaism that made me realize um, I wasn't a Christian. <laughs> like, it made me realize, like, oh, I actually like the way they do things. Like, uh, in Judaism, there's really not heaven or hell. The things that you do on this earth um, for God, you're just doing because you love God, not because there's any kind of inherent. A prize at the end. And I remember thinking that was a very interesting take because that means that anybody who is doing kind things for you are doing it knowing that there was no prize at the end. And then I started thinking about atheism and I was like, oh shit, atheists are the same way. Like they're doing nice things because they want to, not because they have to. But once I was out of Christianity, I really didn't see the appeal to any other religions because I realized all the things that I was questioning about Christianity, I would still question about other religions. So the conversion to Judaism would have literally just been because it was important to their family that they marry somebody who's Jewish. Um, and like, again, whole other chapter of life that could be its own thing. But I realized that 
even if I were to try another religion, it would be the exact same questions that I had with Christianity and that very likely none of it was true. And is there anything you miss about Christianity? Um, I honestly, I do miss the, the idea that there is a God who loves you. When you really think into it, you're like, no, he does. like not based on what he said. You know, if you don't read the Bible before, but I ideally, actually, the, like that, ideally like, something like that would exist. Before I read the Bible, I loved being a Christian, loved it. After I read the Bible, that's when I was like, wait, I got a lot of questions, and this makes sense. So the the community aspect was always great. The having friends instant ready to go because they went to your church was great. I had some fun times at church summer camp. Um, but you can get those exact same uh, feelings and relationships through other groups. I just didn't know that at the time. So I, I do miss that, though. I remember the church people were always the first ones to show up to help you move. They were always the first ones to volunteer if your parents needed a babysitter. Um, I, I enjoyed things like Awanas, which is like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts for church. You have like a vest and you earn little badges and stuff. That was all fun. But you could not pay me to do it again or to go back. <laughs> this is a good segue to the next question uh, from Gurwalk again. What do you think are alternatives to developing community among non-believers? And do you think this is important to do that? Yes, I do think it's important. Um, what I love is with the advent of the internet and stuff like that, it's there are so many communities you can be a part of and you don't ever have to leave your house or you don't have to like sneak out of where you're at and people ask questions who maybe they still think you're religious or something like that. Um, one of the best communities I've ever been a part of has been since I've been on YouTube and, and meeting atheists on YouTube. I've met some really, truly wonderful people who care a lot. Um, some of the people that show up in the comments, you know, uh, like I know Ryan, she's really fantastic. Um, there were a pragmatic crystal, really fantastic people that I've never met in real life, but I know are, um, they care about the same things. They find the same things important. We know a lot of the same people. Um, and if I ever were questioning anything, I know that I could hop onto any of these channels and either watch a video about it or ask the creator about it. Um, and like I live, I actually live very close to secular rarity. So we do a lot of things locally together in person that I think are, are just really wonderful to be a part of. Um, because it's it's easy to say these things online, but when you have to say them live in person in front of people who disagree with you, that it has like a different energy to it and there's like a different challenge there. Mm. But yeah, I would say baby steps start by subscribing to a bunch of YouTube channels that seem to align with things that you're interested in. Then maybe engage in the chat with people and, and get to know people that way. And then maybe find TikTok accounts that are run by the same people or people that are similar. And then just let it go from there and let yourself be a part of that community. Like if you see a channel that you really like is looking for mods, be a mod see what happens. If you see a channel that's looking for people, you know, like mine, where it's like, hey, if you're a total random stranger and you don't have a YouTube following at all, I'd still like to talk to you. Maybe talk to those people when you're ready. You know, we're not always ready. Um, but I do think community is huge because when you're doing something like leaving religion, you are freaking out. Even low key, you're still freaking out. And you need to engage with people who have been there, who have done that. Maybe they're still in the same process, the same step of the process that you are, and they really can keep you grounded for sure. I think it's very important. Wow. That's great. And a question from Hair Specs. Is leaving Christianity a Pandora's box, box moment for you? If not, what would it take for you to consider converting to another it, religion? You, you just can't. You just can't. Now, I will say, I will say that that hole that's left there by religion is very easy to fill with other obsessions. Like you can no longer be a Christian and be a ride or die Swifty that worships her like a god. You know, like you can you can think you're done being a part of organized religion and just be a part of a different organized group that you treat like a religion. You do have to be careful with that. Um, but in terms of actual religion, in terms of there is literally nothing that could get me to truly believe it. Now, 
if tomorrow America is like, we're putting everyone to death who's not a Christian, my channel will be gone. Like, it'll be like, it'll be down, you know, like I will, if the cops show up at my house and they're like, are you a Christian? I'll be like, yeah, sure. Like if I get to live, you know, like I'm not, I'm not one of those people that are like, if somebody held a gun to my head and told me that, you know, no, like I will, I will sing like a canary if it saves my life to pretend to be a part of another religion. I still pray when there's turbulence on a plane, even though I don't think it's going to do me any good. It's still, it's still you know, um, but no, I just, I've never been more sure of who I am as a person and what I believe than I am now. And that would be very, very difficult to ever undo. And I feel like I would be doing myself a disservice by pretending to do anything else religious, I guess. The, the, the amazing thing is that like that crazy far-fetched anecdotes that you mentioned of everyone has to convert or else is something that has happened throughout human it history. It happens every day. Yeah. happens every day. And it's like I insane. said, I'm so grateful that I can just get on here on a Saturday and chat with you and there's not going to be cops knocking on my door being like, I know. yeah, the, you know, like you're an apostate, go to prison. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Uh, it really is sad. Um, well, we have one more religious themed question for you and then the rest are about comedy. Oh, okay. All right. So <laughs> Gerwak asks again, do you think non-believers should question believers? Uh, those questions might provoke thinking, or do you think you should just accept believing statements on face value unless they're, uh, I guess, bigoted? Yeah, so there is there is uh, there's kind of two two answers to that question. So if um, if somebody is asking you, like if a, if a religious person wants to engage in the conversation with you, I would treat that a lot differently than say, I'm just walking down the street and I see somebody who, for whatever reason I know is Christian. So if somebody is engaging with you, I think the most important way that you can really get them to start thinking is to very non-aggressively, very respectfully ask them questions. So I have a lot of people on my podcast that are still religious. And so I say things like, do you mind if I ask what that is? Or do you mind if I ask why you think that? Or hypothetically, if this were to not be true, what would you do? It's less about telling them what you think and more about making them question what they think. So sometimes just asking people why opens that window where they're like, oh, I've never been asked that before. Like nobody's ever questioned me because a lot of Christians are coming from a lifestyle where nobody has ever questioned them or the people who have questioned them have been those loud, angry atheists you see on YouTube who yell and scream at everybody. So that, which is not, I don't think productive for a lot of conversation necessary, maybe depending on who's watching the videos. But um, I think when you're engaging with somebody who engaged you first, just ask them lots of questions. Be very respectful to their answer. Don't let your face show when something they say is absolutely bananas to you. <laughs> oh, interesting. People make fun of me because they can tell when I've heard something I don't know how to respond to on the podcast because I go, interesting, interesting. Well, I'm like trying to think about what I'm going to say back. But with anything like deconstruction, getting clean, losing weight, Change, like getting an education, it has to be up to that person. So you are wasting your time by trying to engage in a, a debate or getting angry or getting like heated, even if they're getting heated, they're going to learn nothing from you by returning that energy. The best thing you can do is be like what people were to me and just ask the right questions. Be like, oh, where did that come from? And, and you, oh, another one that gets people to be open and honest is when they quote something from the Bible and I say, okay, and, and you believe that to be fact. You believe that statement to be fact. They'll usually say, well, I think an interpretation of this. And you find out they aren't nearly as evangelical as they come across when you ask them their opinion in a respectful manner. When you say, okay, so just to be clear, you and you also believe that. And they say, well, to an extent, to a point, yes, no, et cetera. I think that's like the best way to engage with people like that because there is no winner or loser where we're often our, our minds are kind of clouded by this idea that somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And at the end of the day, I get to walk away still an atheist. I still have a YouTube channel. I still have my podcast. Um, 
but they walk away either questioning things and looking into things or blindly continuing to believe what they believed based on how you engage with them. Yeah, and Pragmatic Crystal says it well, that it's a form of street epistemology, exactly. which is a YouTube channel that kind of engages in that approach that you were just talking about. Yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, so first comedy related question. So there's this question that just came up from, actually I'll address this quickly first. So Lycan asks, a lot of people feel an emptiness once they leave their religion. So we did kind of cover that already, uh, like, you know, like what advice we'd give to those people. So you can find it if you go back a little bit. Yeah, in, yeah, in the, it's in the video. That's actually a a big problem. Um, I I interviewed somebody who survived three cults because when he left the first one, you think, oh, I'm never getting involved in another cult again. I'm done. But what you really do is you leave that big empty space for other cult like entities to kind of drag you back in. I think the number one thing and it's very uncomfortable and it's very scary. The number one thing you can do for yourself when you are deconstructing is learn to be alone with your thoughts. Learn to be alone with who you are because you think you are somebody based on what the church told you. And then if you immediately jump into another group, whether it's an atheist, agnostic group, spirituality group, whatever, you're gonna start leaning on them to tell you who you are. So step one is who am I? What do I think, regardless of what anybody else thinks? What are my answers? And those answers can be, I don't know. But you are get to know who you are as a person, what you like, what you think, what your thoughts are outside of any other influence. It doesn't matter what the church says. It doesn't matter what the atheist community says. Who are you? And get to know yourself and make a literal list of things that you never want to be involved in whether it's group types, whether it's thought, schools of thought, you know, whether it's, for example, I'm never going to be somebody who thinks that uh, gemstones can change my life. I'm just not. I don't have disrespect for those people, but I'm never going to be somebody who believes in like gemstones have power for healing or anything like that. I know that about me. So I know as I go into this atheist community, if somebody tries to get me to join their little, you know, oh, I've got like this gemstone group. No, thanks. Appreciate it. Not my thing. Knowing who you are will help you keep from filling that void with something that's unhealthy for you. Um, also, having a pet is a good idea. I had a dog through my deconstruction process, and now I have 10 parrots as well. It's you're, When you're too busy taking care of animals to get involved in like another cult or another like bad group, you're just too busy. So that can help you as well. Um, but just figure out who you are as a person. Do you want to pursue... Um, higher education? Do you want to take a gap year and, you know, try a new job or go to a different school or travel or get a pet or something that knowing who you are will help you fill that void because there will be that void there and you will want to fill it. But if you fill it right now, ASAP, you might find yourself in an unhealthy relationship because you just didn't want to be alone or in a different group who feels like they can tell you how you're supposed to think and feel about things. And then you're just going to be right back to square one, except it won't be a religion you're leaving. It's like a social group or a fraternity or something like that. Um, so be comfortable being alone with your thoughts and figuring out what it is that you think um, unrelated to what anybody else has ever told you. And a friend of the channel, Hassan Radwan, says this. Thanks for joining, Hassan. I warn those who leave religion that they will be tempted to fill the void. There's nothing so easy as catching a heart on the rebound. That's true for romantic relationships and our relationship with religion, I would say. Well, yeah. and that the person who posed the first question actually replied, they said, but the question remains, why are we here doing things to fill up the how, not the why? Um, I wonder if that's just like a, a human trait, maybe. I think humans need to feel needed. They need to feel uh, like part of a group. They need to feel like people miss them and notice them. And so the reason we're always chasing that belonging is because of that inherent need, whether it's psychological or physiological or biological. Um, I don't think we'll ever truly know why we do those things. I'm sure that psychologists have ideas, but I think instead of focusing really on why it's happening, just knowing about yourself that it is happening and what you're going to do about it is also important. And Pragmatic Crystal says this, the big picture, we are here. Enjoy your time. It's short. Yeah. You make your own purpose. We may There may not be an answer to that question of 
we are here for a certain purpose, but yeah. I think we're, we're born and we have all these things that we care about and that matter to us. And that a little bit of that is an element of choice. Mm -hmm. But the thing I always say is that if you see someone, you know, lying, lying on the street in a ditch and they're like, they, they just had their leg blown off or whatever. Like some, I'm thinking of something dramatic now. Yeah. You're not going to just go like, well, life is meaningless. I'm just going to keep walking. Yes. You're going to be compelled to, to try and help that person because you don't want them to suffer. Yeah. And you would hope yeah. that that person would do the same thing for you. Yeah. And I think there is power in that. Yeah. And I don't think that life by itself has any meaning. I think we just happen to be on the evolutionary timeline that makes us human beings. But that doesn't mean you can't make a meaning for yourself and leave a, a great legacy behind. Just because it doesn't have any meaning doesn't mean you can't make one. Yes, I completely agree. All right. So we just have a couple of comedy related questions now and then yeah. we'll wrap this up. So as you mentioned, so Gerwalk, I wanted to ask if you do a creative uh, I was asking about your creative process when it comes to coming up with a religious based comedy bit, but you don't do that. Yeah. Um, and now I will say, I thought about that afterward. I do the only religious comedy that I do is I do have this puppet that shows up in my live streams. That's like the closest to religious comedy that I do. <laughs> okay. Um, it's supposed to be Moses, but I think it just looks like an old white dude. Um, but that's the closest to like religious comedy I've ever gotten. Just because well, I thought that puppet was too funny. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. What's the best joke about Christianity that you know? Do you know any like one-liners? So I, when I thought about this later, I actually have a bit. It's the only religious bit okay. I've ever done. Okay. And I've never actually done it in front of people. I'm using it at a show I have coming up where I talk about how I tell people that I'm an atheist because I want it to look like it was my choice when people don't see me in heaven. <laughs> I want to look like it was my decision. And like, that's the closest to religious that's, that's good. comedy. Yeah, good. I wanted to look like I decided it. There, There's one Jesus joke I know where like, why should you never play uh, the character of Jesus Christ in a video game? Uh, because it takes him three days to respawn. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's one of the few ones I know. That's really funny. I like that. Yeah. All right. Okay. You, you feel free to use it if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> this is for all my gamers out there. Yeah. Gamer humor. Yeah, and this question from Zagros, if you were to do a five-minute comedy monologue and you had to do it about Christianity or the Bible specifically, what book of the Bible would you use for your material or find the most material in? I would either do the book of Genesis or Revelations. I would either do it about the creation of the universe or about the, the, um, the uh, oh, I can't believe I forgot the word for this, the rapture. Um, because to me, those are the two things that people base so much of their beliefs on. And there's so much crazy shit in there. They don't even know because they've never read it. Like this year I read the book of Genesis and there's like the Nephilim, which are these like half angel, half demons that exist because human women existed. And then like fallen angels from heaven had babies with them and they're giant humans. Nobody talked to me about any of this all of my life in church. And I found out about it and I was like, what is this? And I fell down this rabbit hole. Um, so those are the two books that I think people live based off of so directly without knowing at all what it actually says. They take like one or two things out of each book and they, they make their whole personality and identity around that. And they would be shocked to read what the rest of the book says in both of those instances. Or I feel like they would do the, the game of, well, Jonah in the whale. Well, that's like, that's a metaphor. It didn't actually happen. That's a, it's all a metaphor. I except one thing I love certain things. Well, I what I love believe. about religion is when the Bible says something very directly. Like, for example, if your daughter is not a virgin on her wedding day, stone her to death, beginning with her father. Very direct. There's no question about what it's saying. Everybody says that's a metaphor. It was a different time. What he was actually saying is this other thing. But when the Bible is very ambiguous, when they're like, grown men shouldn't lie with boys, people say, no, that definitely means anti-gay. That definitely means that gay people are pedophiles and you shouldn't be friends with them and they're awful. And you're like, that's not a metaphor? Are you sure? Because that sounded like, that sounded very vague to me. Um, it's, it's just very interesting how the things that like, don't eat pork, don't wear mixed fabrics, everybody who likes football on Sundays is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think that's a metaphor. I want to wear this <laughs> jersey and not feel bad about it. But 
when it's like super ambiguous and they can like force it to mean something they want to be the rules. They're like, oh yeah, for sure. That's what God was saying. Definitely. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of having your cake and eating it too there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And this question is, I think advice for anyone who wants to become a stand-up comedian, what's yeah. the shortest set, or I guess what's the ideal set length that a first timer should work on? I would say aim for uh, three or four minutes. Most open mics that I've ever come in contact with have been uh, at most four minute sets. So in class, we typically work on five minutes, but I would say between three and four minutes is the perfect amount of time. People will love you if you get off stage before your time is up. If you're not that person that's like, let's see, huh, what else? I've got two more minutes to stand up here and meander. Um, a, a, like a solid three to four minute set is perfect. It's not too long, not too short. And it offers you the ability to just make like a really clean, solid set that's the perfect length for anything you're going to use it for. And leave them wanting more. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, those are all the questions for you, Sydney. I think there's one last question for me. So uh, Lomu asks, do you think you may do a podcast with a Christian one day, I don't know your story, but feel like you never really meet an open Christian. I actually did do an interview with a questioning Christian on the channel a while back. Um, if you, Lom, if you want to check that out, you can find it somewhere <laughs> in my channel. Was It was a while ago. Yeah. yeah. So I have done it, but I, I mean, I live in Canada, so I've met a lot of open Christians. I have friends who are open Christians, but I think this is a unique forum to just really delve into those subjects mm -hmm. about Christianity that I, I'm not able to in, in my personal life because yeah, maybe they don't know that much about that, their own religion or yeah. it's a sensitive subject. You don't know. So I, I am definitely planning on exploring Christianity more on the channel in the coming months. So thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. And one last thing from Connor Phillips here again. So we have a scientific literacy problem where even atheists still believe in astrology or trust authority figures as if their word is divine when science should have no authorities, just experts. I think that just kind of comes down to whether it's religion or not, I think asking questions and having a skeptical approach to things is, is really important. And to your point yeah. from earlier, Sydney, I think one of the things that religion does uh, as an untended consequence maybe is it makes people more willing to believe things without evidence Yes. Uh, yes. Just because they happen to believe in a religion, it can kind of extend to other domains of life. Yes. And and something else that's interesting is when when Christians say, I'm just following this in case it's true. Worst case scenario, it's not. When you say the exact same thing about like science or about like health advice, they get upset with you for that. Like during the pandemic, I feel like we saw a lot of that where I'm like, I'm going to wear this mask. Worst case scenario, the mask does not work and I still get COVID. Best case scenario, it does. I'm glad I wore it. It's not a big deal. For some reason, that that can be applied to religion where you're like, hey, worst case scenario, it didn't matter. But when that same person hears you apply that same logic to something else, they uh, they don't agree with it. They're like, no, that's yeah. too much. I don't want to do that. That's And I've never understood why if you're going to live that way in one section of your life why can't you also apply that same thing to like science changes all the time I, i'm the first one to admit that i love science i believe science but it changes all the time we used to think smoking was good for you now we're like are you are you kidding that's crazy um so it will eventually change and maybe one day we find out that masks actually didn't do anything but i'm gonna do it anyway it i'm gonna do it anyway i'm gonna i'm gonna do what i have to do to to, in my opinion, keep people safe. If I find out one day it didn't do anything, looks like I just wore a mask for two years for no reason. Oh, well, like, you know. <laughs> I, I, I hope I hope that's not the case. Yeah. No, no, and I don't think it will, be, but <laughs> people love to ask that. They're like, well, what if you find out it was all for nothing? I'm like, I, know, I can sleep well at night knowing that I wasn't one of the people refusing to do something that could potentially help other people. Especially something that's not that invasive as, as wearing a mask. Yeah. It's really not. It's really yeah. not. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, we, we could have a whole discussion about that subject right there. But unfortunately, that's all our time now. Thank you so much again, Sydney. Uh, I think there was a lot of interesting things that we explored here. And thank you again for everyone for your questions. I think there were some yeah. really great questions from, from a lot of people. 
And uh, thank you, especially to Gerwalk. I, Gerwalk supplied a lot of the questions. Yay. So <laughs> yeah, if you want to, again, if you want to check out Sydney's podcast, the links are all in the video description. You can also apply to be a guest on the, on the podcast too. Yeah. Again, in the video description. And yeah, so thank you everyone. And I'll be back with another video soon. I hope you all enjoy, what day is it today? You all enjoy your Saturday. Saturday, right? <laughs> yes, yes. That, that I right. do know. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care, everyone.